Please pray with me. In the introduction to the prayer, I'm going to use the third verse of one of our hymns, hymn number 594, God's own child, I gladly say it. Listen carefully to this verse. Satan, hear this proclamation, I am baptized into Christ. Drop your ugly accusation, I'm not so soon enticed. Now that to the font I've traveled, all your might has come unraveled. And against your tyranny, God, my Lord, unites with me. Let us pray. Merciful Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and through the waters of holy baptism, you called us to be your very own possession. Please, we pray, grant that our lives may evidence the working of your Holy Spirit in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control according to the image of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray, amen. God's grace, his mercy, and his peace to you in Jesus' holy name. That's my opportunity to say Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Okay, come on. Let's pretend they didn't. Yeah, I think so too. Now is my chance to greet you in the new year. Happy New Year. Wow, you're alive, you're awake, you're there. Thank you very much for that. In the celebration of 2014, uh, something happens very quickly within the Holy Scriptures that we read together as we go through and we march through the life of Jesus Christ. Just last week, if you were here last week, uh, you noticed a little bit of a difference in our sanctuary area. I, I said last service that, that Pastor Tony just picked this wonderful week. Oh, Pastor George, can you preach on the, bab- the, on the Feast of the Baptism of our Lord? Can you preach that Sunday? I didn't realize that's because now all the stuff has been taken down and all the beauty. And everybody comes in, they look, and they're going, ah, eh, look at this. Oh, it's all missing. And uh, where's the stuff of Christmas and Epiphany? The only thing we needed to focus on, though, right there, the font the font, the baptismal waters, which claim us, Jesus Christ, claims us as his own. For you know, last week, the epiphany of our Lord, the Magi arriving to worship the Christ child. And we fast forward in one week's time now to the celebration, the feast of the baptism of our Lord. Jesus is some 30 plus years old. That's a fast growth spurt if I had ever seen one. Now we find him at the River Jordan, the heavenly descent of the Son of God, the heavenly descent of Jesus the Christ, finds its rest in the River Jordan. As Jesus comes from Galilee to John, there in the wilderness. The text of Holy Scripture in Isaiah 42, Behold my servant, says the Lord, through this great voice of the prophet Isaiah. Yes, beloved in the Lord, yes, behold the one in the water. Behold the one whose sandals we are unworthy to loosen. Behold the one who has come to be servant for us all and to be our salvation. He is the undoing of the devil's work. Where he goes, he goes for us, for you, for the world. What he does, he does for us, for you, for the world. Jesus is not standing there in the River Jordan for himself. He is about his Father's work. Thus he is there for us, for you, for the world. Thus Jesus comes from Galilee into the Jordan River to John to be baptized by John. But why? Why would Jesus do this? Why come to John to be baptized? Why do what the sinners are called to do? Why be likened with such a class of people like this? Jesus is the righteous one. Jesus is the Lord. John, the servant, 
Yet the word of the Lord to us in Isaiah 42, as we heard read earlier, Behold my servant. Now Isaiah is not speaking of John the baptizer, not in this text. Isaiah's finger stretches through 700 years of time and space, echoing through the hearts of the faithful, sounding over the waters of the River Jordan, all attention on Jesus. Behold, my servant. Jesus has come to be servant. Jesus has come to bend the knee. Jesus has come to gird himself in lowliness, in humility, to do what proud and arrogant hearts don't want him to do, to suffer, to die, and to rise again for us, for you, for the world. Jesus comes to John, but John would rather come to Jesus. John has things mixed up a little bit backwards, doesn't quite understand, can't quite get it. Not yet. Sinful hearts believe in works righteousness. Jesus is Lord. I must serve him. I must be the servant, not Jesus. Thus it is with us. It is with John as well. The text of our gospel said it clearly. John tried to prevent Jesus saying, I have need to be baptized by you. And you come to me? You see, works righteousness prevents Jesus. Holds up one's own works. Tries to be the servant. Tries to keep Jesus separate, distinct, apart from sinners. When Jesus is separate, distinct, and apart from sinners, he is then no longer our Emmanuel. He ceases to be God with us. He really becomes then God over us. And when Jesus is God over us rather than God with us, hearts are left to despair. What must I do? What must I do becomes then the clarion call. It becomes the eternal question. When there is something to be done, we act as the servant. And that is what we really most prefer. I know it sounds backwards, but when we are the servant... We can't help but believe that we are the ones in control. And it's always about control, isn't it? Jesus is Lord, and I must do these things, whatever these things are, I must do these things for Him. And when I'm done doing the things for Jesus, and when I'm the one doing these things for Jesus, then I can determine how often and how well they are done, or they're not done. I can decide when to do them. I can choose for myself what's good for me. As long as I say, I'm doing it for Jesus, it's okay. When I'm the servant, I'm the one doing the giving. When I'm the one doing the giving, I'm not the one receiving. And why should I receive anything but praise? My gifts are sufficient, are they not? (laughs) Well, no. No, because if that were true... There would be no need for Jesus to be Emmanuel, God with us. If that were true, there would be no need for Jesus to come to John and be baptized. My serving, my giving, my doing for Christ will always fall short. And so will yours. You and I and the world have nothing good to offer Jesus, not even our hearts, as much as we'd like to believe that. We have nothing to give to Jesus except our sins. Jesus comes to John to be baptized, to fulfill all righteousness because we have no righteousness in ourselves. Jesus wishes to be God with us. He is our Emmanuel, God with us. God with us means he is with us in everything, even in the mire and muck of our sin, our death, and our hell. There is to be no distinction or separation between Jesus and sinners. That is how God has decided things to be. So Jesus comes to John. 
drives through John's stop sign, runs over his misunderstandings of the heart and mind of God, and he receives holy baptism. He fulfills all righteousness. Stepping into the water, the righteous one, Jesus our Lord, steps into a pool and pool of filth and wretchedness and death. He steps into our sin and he is immersed in it. Poured over his head are your dirty thoughts, your lewd comments, your hateful behaviors. Dripping down Jesus' face are your violent outbursts, your adulterous deeds, your imperfect parenting, your stubborn, stiff-necked arrogance, your proud offerings. His body drips with sin-tainted water, your sins, all your sins, all the world's sins. His flesh is tainted with your infirmities, your frailties, your afflictions, and your death. There is no water in the world dirtier than the water of Jesus' baptism. In that water, Jesus becomes unclean, dirty, and sinner. For the Scriptures remind us, He who knew no sin becomes sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Our sin is lavished upon Him, and with our sin so also our death and our hell lavished upon Jesus. Now stepping out of the water, so near and united with sinners, Jesus takes his first steps to the cross. To the cross he will go, for that is the cost of your sins. There the righteousness of God suffers for the sins of the world. Now if he does not have your sins, if you still hold on to them, cling to them, Try to make up for them in your own way. Try to do it all yourself to be the servant. Then you will suffer for your sins. You will suffer and you will die the sinner's death and Jesus will always and forever be apart from you. Therefore, turn. Turn. Repent. Live. Jesus goes to the cross so that you do not have to. He suffers in your place. He offers His righteousness on behalf of your faults. Stands between you and heaven with you in the presence of the living God. He is your holy advocate. He is your righteousness, your Savior. He dies, the righteous for the unrighteous. He is buried that having sanctified your graves, death may be but a portal to eternal life. He rises again on the third day, that death may not hold you, but that with his stepping from the grave in victory, you too may on that last day step out of the tomb alive, risen, resurrected, without sin, never to die again. Thus, Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan fulfills all righteousness. He takes away sin and offers instead perfection, holiness, all that is His. He cleanses the water, makes it pure, makes it fresh and full of life. He serves humanity in the water. As servant, He gives. As servant, giving, He redeems. He gives to you the redemption of your lives, your bodies, your eternity. He gives these gifts, these things you cannot earn for yourself. He gives these gifts through water and the Word. His baptism becomes your baptism. For water is just water without the Word of God. But with the Word of God, the water becomes holy, divine, life-giving. It is a water for therein you receive your servant God. You are baptized by Him. You are crucified with Him. You are buried with Him. You are raised with Him. And you are given manifold gifts and holy treasures. Your sins are washed away. Your death is drowned. Your hope is renewed. Your life is regenerated. All because of the very gift of God, the heavens are rent asunder. The Holy Spirit descends upon you, fills your heart, and quickens your heart with faith. 
that faith immediately latches to the Word of God, draws near the Savior Himself, and rejoices in Emmanuel, God with us, that God is with us in His Son. And the Father trumpets from heaven, This is my Son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Pleased with His Son, Jesus, the Father God is pleased with all who are clothed with His Son's righteousness. He is pleased with all who believe and are baptized. Beloved in the Lord Jesus, hear His word. Jesus comes to John. Jesus comes to you. He comes to you to be servant. Suffering servant. The servant of the Lord. He comes to be Emmanuel. God with us. And as God with us, He is near us. Let us not be found preventing Him from serving us with holy treasures. Let us not be found stubbornly holding on to our sins and forbidding Jesus from dealing with us according to His marvelous grace. Rather, let us behold the servant of the Lord. Let us surrender to His holy word and allow Him to work His wonders within us. Clinging to His Word, we cling to His Son. Clinging to His Son, there is no separation between us and God. We are in Christ, and Christ is in us. With Christ in us, we are a new creation, risen into the newness of life toward God. New and risen, we are sure and we are certain. No more fearful, guilt-ridden, nobody loves me, me against the rest, me against the system, me separate, me alone. No more of this. No more of it. Not us. Not us Christians. Not us who have been united with Jesus Christ. Jesus is baptized. I am baptized into Jesus. You are baptized into Jesus. He is united with me and with you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we rejoice in you that you grab hold of us and call us your, your own by name, redeemed us and called us for your holy purposes here. Use us for your glory's sake here, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join with me as together.